you say it's safe, you might say it's not dangerous. So the way we look to the future in climate is we build climate models. We don't have any data in the future, of course. So we build climate which are very similar to weather forecasting models. Now these are sets of equations that we solve in the biggest computers in the world, and we're limited by the size of those computers. The amount of computation we can get limits what we can do. So we solve these equations. They couple the atmosphere, the ice, the ocean, the ice. They now start to couple in the biosphere. Um, the next thing is probably going to be to try putting the um, economic system into them as well. So the way the science on climate is fed into the system is through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This was actually set up in 88 by the United Nations Environment Program and the World Met Office. And they have assessment reports, the first one 1990 and then through the fourth assessment in 2007. And they're working on the fifth assessment report now in 2013. And they produce an assessment of what the scientific research says. And they have a deadline for when they will take results from. And the current deadline for this one is that if you have a scientific paper that's submitted before the end of July this year, it can be included. So I and all my colleagues are frantically writing papers <laughs> to be able to get them into the next IPCC. Here are some results from the last one, the fourth assessment. And this massive alphabet soup down here, which doesn't actually make any sense to anybody, these are the names of all the models that are actually represented on here. So before each IPCC, they have what's called a CLIP, Climate Model Intercomparison Program. Now, the IPCC doesn't go to people and say, please run a model. They all volunteer. Anyone can volunteer. Anyone who can satisfy certain conditions, they say you have to run uh, greenhouse gas scenarios, you have to have a model that includes these processes, but anyone can. You can see that all these different countries, different institutions, these two are the two UK Met Office ones, there's the Japanese ones, there's the HM is a German one, uh, there's an Australian one. So all countries can sign up and they just put it in the big archive and that will be then taken forward into the process. So this shows the increase in temperature, projected increase in temperature, and you can see there's sort of massive spaghetti with this black line through the middle where they've just taken the mean. But there's no reason to think the mean is actually any better than any of the models. Okay? Um, this is temperature, and this is precipitation, and you can see they differ a lot more in precipitation than they do with temperature, because we don't do that as well. And this number up here, this A2, A1B, and B1, that's the greenhouse gas future that they use to drive the model. Um, so a bunch of economists sat down in a room and they worked out some possible futures. So the A1s are aggressive capitalism and the B1s are a more benign green world. And then the 1s and 2s give you the detail of doing that. Uh, are you looking at climate models or earth system models? These are all these are all what we've got climate models. Okay. When I come on to the next one, to see bit five, there are, some of those are earth system models. Okay. So the difference, people don't know the difference. An earth system model has the biosphere stuff in as well as the climate. The climate would be the atmosphere, ocean, and sea ice. Um, and then an earth system model you add in the terrestrial um, uh, some of these may not even have proper oceans. Okay, so these, these are good. They'll have a flat ocean. I think, I think most of the, I, I couldn't tell you all of them, but they were getting towards that oceans at this point. Um, so there's the difference. So this is the benign scenario here. You can see that the, this is done as a relative temperature, and they're just about meeting the two degrees if we follow B1. At the moment, the emissions are pretty much following uh, at least A2, if not the one that's worse than that, which isn't on this plot. 
And this is a <coughs> diagram taken from the ICC, another from the ICC's report. This is from the, um, they produce a big thick report that you can read with all the detail in it, but they also produce an executive summary for policy makers, and this is taken from the one for policy makers. Um, and this shows again some of those scenarios, and um, this is the spread of the models around that, and then again there's here with some more realistic spreads where they've widened the uncertainty out because we know there's some uncertainties not included in, in that. Well, that was the last, that was 2007. Um, CMIP 5, um, if anyone follows this, there was never a CMIP 4. <laughs> there was a CMIP 1, 2, 3, and 5, but CMIP 3 went with um, the assessment report 4, so they put them in line, they made them both 5. So if you, if you want to download the data, which you can, anyone can get hold of this data. Um, if you want to look at it, it's 5, if you want to look at it for the latest one, it's 3 for the one before. So I've downloaded some of the results yesterday. They're still coming in, they haven't finished all the runs, so I'm going to show some of the results that uh, I've downloaded. They've gone away from those scenarios, so we can't actually compare directly what was in the last report with what's going to be in the next report. And they have these things called RCPs now, and I can't know what RCP stands for. Um, so they're a, again, a bunch of economists have sat in a room and come up with a greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, this is the benign one. So this has us going up to 460, just under 460, 450 uh, ppm CO2 equivalent. This is all greenhouse gases. Um, and then actually it's starting to fall down. Now they actually take them under 2300 now because people want to take the models further forward. But the scenarios, the runs I've got only go to 2100. Um, you can see under that scenario, this is an average of all the models, and I can't remember how many, well, I don't know how many there were, and it's going to vary from plot to plot, because some people have done some scenarios and not others. <coughs> you can see that if this is where we are now, and you'll notice this first bit of the curve is the same, or pretty much the same in all the runs, which is good. Um, we actually do manage, and they've got real temperatures now rather than difference, but we do manage to keep within the two degrees, if we could keep to that scenario. Sorry, they're, going to get, they're going to get scarier as we get into it. <laughs> this one, RCP 4.5, we stabilise at somewhere around 580, and we don't come back down again, we just stabilise at 580. Okay? In this case, the temperature at 2100 is still rising, and it's already at 16, we're about 13 half to 14, so it's gone beyond the two. We now go to RCP 6, where we stabilise somewhere towards the end of, well, the middle of the next century at about 800. We're well beyond 16. And it's still going on. So yeah. you have to use the vertical scale? The vertical scale, this is temperature. Yeah, and mean surface temperature. This is mean, mean surface temperature around the globe. Yeah. The current temperature is about 413.7. And this is going up. It, it, they're all on the same scale from 13 to 19. I put them all on the same scale. Because otherwise it gets complicated. This is the final one that they did, 8.5. This one is really scary because they let it go up to 2,700, something like that. Um, and in which case, by the end of the century, we're already beyond 18. So that's the spread of the new results. Um, now, there's vast amounts of data here. There's many, many petabytes of data to be sieved and taken to understand what's going on with these models. There are many, well, <coughs> let's go back to the previous slide. You can see how many models there were in the previous one. There's probably double that now. Every country in the world has to have a climate model. Um, and some of them will submit two, had um, the UK submitted two last time. I think they've got two this time. Some of them are assistant models, they have the bioexperience, we need to so analyze those separately. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but I thought it was worth showing you at least some of the results that are, the results that are there. If you do a, a Google search on CMIT 5, you can find the repository, you can sign up for it if you want. These, these plots, uh, the results, I did these plots myself, these plots I actually downloaded from a site run by KNMI, the Dutch Met Office. 
we've got a quite nice site where you can actually plot things online if you want to play and, and have a look and see what's, what the latest science is. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe five, ten minutes of Q&A before we move on to the next speaker. So a few short questions at the back. Yeah, um, the, um, <coughs> you mentioned methane in the typical scenario and all of the other ones you picked up no, were mentioned by Lenten. Um, and I just wondered um, whether you could have read that and, and also relate to that. Um, are any of the models that you've put up there, do they have methane clathrate and come across methane feed? Okay. Or not? No, they don't. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I've got this list up. Why did I put them? These are sensors, the big ones, right? The me methane is definitely one side now. I know there's a, there's a session on methane later, so I didn't want to get terribly into methane. Um, none of the models in the CBET 5 are going to catch any of these different points because they're looking at what we expect, which is the 50% chance, and these are probably all less than 50% chance, and one hopes they're a lot less than 50% chance. So the models tend to underestimate these, these things. There are no, there are the no surprises simulation. These are the surprises in the system. And the reason I talk more about this one is because I'm actually working on this one. Uh, and we have to do research on what are the chances of these surprises happening and what we can do to make those risks as low as possible rather than, you know, this is, this is scary enough, but this is just steadily as she goes. If you have a, a, a class rate explosion of evidence, all, but, all bets are off. Yeah. Now, these models... They, they, they don't have that. So, thank you. Um, we got you first, and then you, and then as well. So, we've got three questions. Yes, okay. yes, yes. that's you. Uh, two questions. Feel free to answer my question. <laughs> 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 it's a good start. Um, one of them is I saw, I think they might be related as well. I saw a map of the world which, was, um, which had a difference from average temperatures. Yeah. across the world. I can't remember where I saw it. It's quite recent and it must be some very mainstream publication in your yeah. paper. And it had, um, obviously, a whole number of areas which were where there was increases in temperatures, but a whole number of areas in which there was a decline in temperature from the average. Yeah. So I wanted you to just say a couple of words on that, if you can. I'm sure you can. Um, and secondly, is one of the things I think is happening in a more political, social way is that the, the, the level of interest is still very high and concern is still very high, much higher than I think that many people feel it is amongst ordinary people. And I think that's fueled by an experience of changing weather patterns which people are trying to understand. But because because things are framed in terms of global warming and our changing weather patterns often doesn't represent certainly this part of the world doesn't appear to reflect warming. Could you say something about the relationship between weather and climate okay. that would help? Because yeah. I think that's something that, as actors, we have to begin to tackle. Yeah. Yeah. These plots here are global mean temperature. Nobody ever feels global mean temperature. It, it's a, something we've made up, in fact. Um, you feel local temperature and local precipitation, and they're going to be very different from the global mean because they've got weather on them. Even if you warm the world up, and there was no weather, there would be differences. The Arctic, or the polar regions, are warming faster than the rest of the world. And that's just to do with the way the planet system works. And there are, I talked about El Nino. El Nino is about 10 year, it isn't actually a cycle, it doesn't repeat, but it comes about every 10 years. And an El Nino will completely wreck the statistics here. These, you see where the print, this is much smoother than this is back here this doesn't have as much weather in it. Some of these are volcanoes going off. You set up a volcano, you'll, you'll cool the planet, but you'll cool some parts of the planet more than you'll cool other parts of the planet. There's an awful lot of complication going on. In the previous set of runs, I haven't done it for this, but the previous ones, the, although they agree 
on the global scale, they don't agree on the local scale. And one hopes that the CBIT 5 ones are going to agree much more on that local scale, so you can say that the predictions for London are more solid than the predictions for the world. The predictions for the world are fairly solid. I'm pretty sure I've you know, put money on that. Under this no surprises thing. But when it comes to the local, the models are still not agreeing. And that's really important. Yet weather is so important to, for what you actually see. And you know, can we attribute any extreme weather event to climate change? No. But there are things happening that are different to what we've seen before. I can't prove that, but I can. And my personal opinion is, yes, it does seem to. to the weather seems to be more, less predictable than it used to be, not in the sense of weather forecasting, but predictable in the sense of the seasons seem to be rather different than they used to be. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember lots of seasons, and that's different. Thanks. Right. So um, just these two, then we have to move on. Um, I was kind of curious to, to know more about the, what the simulation for the emissions pathways are. I mean, how fast would you be having to cut CO2 emissions, for example, when would we have to be peaking in order to achieve that? So just, just to repeat that so everyone can hear. Uh, so how fast do we need to cut emissions and when do we need to peak? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid that's a question I can't really answer. Right, okay. uh, there are a set of environmental economists sat down <coughs> and, and did these for the CNET 5. Um, they're, they're, there's literature out there you can get that will explain how they did it. Um, there will be, I, if it's like the EPA for the previous ones, which I did know a bit more about, they actually had a storyline. I don't know whether these have a storyline or whether they are just an emission. Can I just make a quick comment on that? Yeah, sure. to try and ask a question. Yeah. It's, it's notable that historically we've always been around or in excess of the worst case scenarios that the, um, uh, the RPCC have considered. So I would have placed a lot of store by RCP 2.6 to be planning where it's the future. But I've never seen any scenarios predict that we could get 2,000 uh, plus two million by the end of the century. Well, that was the third graph that you should. Yeah. The end of the century, you're still at about oh, okay, right. twelve hundred. And I think some of these are just to span the range, so you've got above and below. I think they took very seriously the fact that we were doing worse than the scenario, scenarios, so they put one in that we couldn't do worse than. Just to see what right. <laughs> we're going to try. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a challenge. <laughs> Final question. Oh, I it was Sorry, behind you. I am, by research and teaching experience, an economician. Now, I am also <coughs> aware that some of the problems which are uh, encountered in an attempt to get a reliable statistical fit of any computer model apply as if, like, uh, the model being nonlinear and there be no observations outside the sample range, apply as a vengeance to climate models. Uh, nevertheless, they've been long enough around that I would like to know to what extent an attempt has made to run various models according to how well they actually <coughs> explain the cost. Okay. So just to repeat that, yep. what attempts have been made to rank different types of models? Okay, when we take this great mass of models and try and produce a single best number, um, <coughs> in the, I showed the previous slide where they just took the mean, well, that's a very naive thing to do because we know some of these models are better than some of the others. So what, what's done is they take the historical record and they see how well they fit the historical record. <coughs> um, now, you're quite right that the non-linearities in these models kick in as you get away from the historical. The 20th century is fairly flat. It's a bit boring for a climatologist. Uh, so what they're starting to do is to take the same models and run them during the last glacial maximum. So they try and reproduce the climate of the last ice age, where the, there are different sets of where some systems pushing it on the, edge the other way. But it gives you some confidence by looking at previous climates that the models are the least robust enough to, to generate. The, the, as far as we can tell, it's difficult to measure the climate for that. But that's where that work is, is done. So we, we take the 20th century and we also try and produce climates from the past, particularly the last glacial maximum. It's a very different climate. So those same models 
or versions of them will be people run on the paleo planet. Well, we'll expand on your answer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you, you, you familiar with client predictions on that, you might run on your home PC. There's a, there's a project that lets you run um, climate models on your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the back test. That's the back test of climate models with existing data. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have, we'll have to move on. We've got a few more things to get to. Please hold your questions, and if we have time at the end, we'll come back to them. Thank you. Um, well, you could introduce me, but I think you did before that. Yeah. No, I'm going to talk about him, and he's going to do oh, the film. Yeah. That's all right, but we'll get out and make us out, ask a twist and, and get on with it. I'm David Wasdell, I direct the Apollo Gaia project. I'm doing the next talk after the film. Nick Breeze is with Graham, no, what's his name? House? Uh, Gary, Gary House. Gary House. Um, have produced the trailer to a new form of climate um, documentary, but in more, much more interactive intent and so on, to break through the, the veto on decent documentaries on climate, if we can. And this is the trailer. You've been working on it flat out this week. I hope the sound works. Should be. So if it doesn't, we will see. Okay. Nick okay. Reeves, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Climate tipping point refers to the fact that there are physical systems in the climate system that respond only slowly. So we can begin to force them now, but the response will occur over coming decades and centuries, and we may push it beyond a point where that response is going to happen, even if we try to stop it. So for example, an ice sheet. As we make as we change the composition of the atmosphere so there's more energy coming into the planet than there is going out, well, that tends to melt ice. But it only these ice sheets are two or three kilometers thick, so they don't respond quickly. But once they do begin to move, they begin to disintegrate. You can get to a point where it's then out of control. It doesn't matter. You can reduce the gases, but the dynamics has taken over. It's going to the centigrade and sea level is going to go up. The question about a tipping point is also profoundly important. Not only do the feedbacks accelerate climate change, but they reach the point where the power of the feedback overwhelms our capacity <coughs> to intervene and damp the system's behavior. And at that point, we move into runaway change over which we have no further control. Once we pass past that threshold, we precipitate a mass extinction event similar to the five that we've already experienced in geological time with the potential to wipe out 80-90% of life on this earth. We don't want to go there. We have to work very fast to prevent the system moving into a, an accelerated and destabilized process that then pushes us beyond that critical threshold, the point of no return. Well, the Arctic is warming faster than most places on the planet. And that's partly because of the sea ice. Because as we begin to lose some of the sea ice, it exposes the darker ocean, which absorbs more sunlight, and it causes the ocean to warm further and melt more ice. So we will probably lose the summer sea ice. There are potential irreversible effects of melting the sea ice. If it begins to allow the Arctic Ocean to warm up and warm uh, 
the ocean floor, then we'll begin to release methane hydrates. And if we let that happen, that's a potential tipping point that we don't want to pass. Now, there's a feedback cluster in the methane cycle which operates like this. It's driven by temperature, and the warmer the temperature gets, the greater bacterial activity and the increased methane production. This we already see. More methane production, more global heating, temperature goes up, bacteria not it even more, more methane that we got there. That's what feedback's all about. The next one, tundra permafrost, those great areas of icy waste with fossil ice left over from the last ice age deep on the ground and the surfaces which just thaw a little bit in the summer and freeze again in the winter. Today they are thawing deeper and deeper. So I would say that we started investigation the methane issue in the Arctic in 90s of the last century, and we started from the terrestrial ecosystem, freshwater ecosystem, and then um, about uh, eight years ago, switched to studying the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, and actually we've been studying it for the last eight years, continuously, year by year by year, conducting one or two expedition a year. In the atmosphere, the amount, the total amount of methane in the atmosphere, in the current atmosphere, it's about five gigatons. <coughs> the amount of carbon um, preserved um, in form of methane in this Bernoctic shell is approximately from hundreds to thousands of gigatons. And of course, it's only one percent of that uh, amount is required to double the atmospheric burden of methane. But the to destabilize 1% of this carbon pool, I think it's not much effort needed, considering that the state of permafrost and the amount of methane currently involved. And then the really big one, there is about three times the amount of hydrocarbon energy stored in methane clathrates, as they call them, the frozen lattices of methane stored in the shallow seas, appropriate temperature and pressure conditions, three times as much hydrocarbon energy in that methane store as in the total store of coal, oil, and gas combined. That's a lot, a lot of energy. As the seas start to warm with global warming, that methane can start to release. The sediment core was unfrozen. There are now observations that methane is beginning to be released by both melting tundra on the land and bubbling up in the Arctic Ocean. <coughs> we're, we're finding that you know, methane is escaping from permafrost as it's melting from uh, sea ice uh, regions. Um, uh, we call this a, a carbon cycle feedback. It's a response of the climate system um, by putting more methane into the atmosphere as we warm the planet. Well, methane is also, like CO2, a very potent greenhouse gas. And so that's amplifying the warming. It's a positive feedback, which isn't a good thing. It's an amplifying factor. It's making the warming uh, even worse than it would have been otherwise. We know that the NASA satellite monitoring has shown plumes of methane coming up from the shallow seas of the north of Siberia as the clathrates in that continental shelf begin to move decades ahead. We have already activated the methane bomb, as they call it. That if the warming continues, the larger and maybe a great and massive amount of methane could be released from this green Arctic shell. Of course, there is a potential risk. And in terms of potential risk, uh, I would say that this green Arctic shelf is the most potential because, as you said, the carbon pool is huge and the, the water shallow is very shallow and the warming occurs stronger than in different areas of the world ocean. We do not like what we see there. Absolutely do not like. It's hard for the scientists to make the public realize that we do have an emergency. We will certainly get those effects. We can't say exactly what date 
an ice sheet is going to collapse, but we know that the ice sheets will collapse and sea level will go up many meters. We, if we burn all the fossil fuels, then we certainly will cause the methane hydrates eventually to come out and cause several degrees more warming. And it's not clear that civilization could survive that extreme climate change. It's an example of an uncertainty. It's something we didn't quite understand. We're understanding better and better. It's an example of an uncertainty that's not breaking in our, our favor. It's breaking against us, uh, which is to say that you know sometimes critics will cite uncertainty, scientific uncertainty, as a reason not to act on the problem. But in fact, if you talk to economists, they'll tell you it's just the opposite, because some of these uncertainties have to do with things that are actually leading to larger changes than what we had uh, projected originally with our climate models. And so there's the possibility that uncertainty will lead to far more drastic changes than what we currently project. You don't want to push the system past those kind of tipping points, because if we do, we leave a situation for our children and grandchildren that will be out of their control. They won't be able to stop it. several collaborators and we're trying to convince Channel 4 of a, of a way to accept it uh, well, through one of our partners and we're trying to wrap it up in a, in a different element of almost like a human <coughs> tipping point of, of how what makes people engage with these issues so it's sort of changing the context but this becomes an example so it's quite a complicated Sorry, I don't know yeah, yeah, so we're working on it with other collaborators, and at the moment we're trying to convince the uh, uh, broadcasters to take it on. Uh, not that, they don't seem to be that keen at the moment, unless we make it more uh, palatable to the, to the general public. Just, uh, we'll, we'll let you know. When. What, what will the title be? Uh, we're, we're, we're Palatable climate change. Yeah. This, was a, this was a, the title today was was for today, and we were probably thinking more along the lines of a human tipping point in terms of what point do we start to engage with the seriousness of these issues. The assertion that climate change is the greatest hoax that has ever been perpetrated in human civilization is itself the greatest hoax that has ever been perpetrated in human civilization. And those who have put it in the public domain <coughs> will stand at the bar of the judgment of history will, I think, be arraigned and found guilty of crimes against humanity. I think it's that serious. That was the shout I prepared for the plenary, but then I didn't have a chance to put it in the plenary. Never mind. <laughs> now, somebody's saying, like, I need to speak louder. Is that correct? Yes, please. Please, a bit louder. Okay, those of us who are slightly deaf and wear hearing aids deafen ourselves when we speak in public, so we dumb it down. I will try and keep it up. Will you give me an up? Thank you. Every time. Yes. Okay. Um, this presentation takes two hours. 
I have 15 minutes, <laughs> so I'm not going to do all of it, obviously. And what I want to do, um, would you bear with me a second? Because if I can see, it says end show, which to me is the right thing to do next. Um, if I put this on a slightly different controller, like this, then I can select slides. Can I? No. Could you do a yes? Don't you got to do yes? Yeah, yes. it hasn't changed that yet. I haven't changed it. That's good. Get a yes one. Three, two, one. Don't apply. Thank you. That gives me control again. Because. First of all, by how much does the Earth system amplify the effects of carbon dioxide emission that we're doing? What's the amplification, the multiplication, if you like, embedded in the Earth system? That's fundamental. Almost all the models that Peter's just been showing us have a fairly conservative answer to that question. We wanted to know how conservative it is, and can we get a better answer? The second question we were set up to look at was this. Is there not just a tipping point in the, what we call the energy subsystems, which we've had several references, like the methane, the Sahara, the overturning systems, um, Amazon forests, um, ice sheet collapse, and so on. Is there a tipping point in the Earth system as a whole that moves us from a solution that comes to a new equilibrium and pushes us beyond a critical threshold into self-amplification or runaway behavior. It's never happened before on this planet. It has happened for a limited period on Venus, which is now restabilized at a very high temperature. Is there such a possibility on this planet? And if so, how close to the boundary? What sets it off? What are the conditions? That was the agenda. The first four years, we tried to work out um, I mean, I've got all sorts of things like this one, but this is basically what Peter is showing us. So I'm going to bypass all those and go straight on through these to this kind of question. We are accelerating the accumulation of uh, greenhouse gases, and the feedback system is amplifying what we are doing. So the question is basically, by how much? So that's the fundamental agenda that this is all about. Uh, we looked at the feedback dynamics, and here are some of the pictures of them. Uh, here's one, for instance, all the different drivers of climate change, num numbered clusters of feedback processes driven by temperature, activating drivers, changing the forcing, changing the temperature, changing the drivers, and so on. So that's the feedback system. Easy to build a conceptual model, get it in our heads, virtually impossible to do all the actual feeding of the facts, if you like, the numbers involved in each particular feedback mechanism, let alone all their interactions and come to some kind of understanding. In other words, the output of that modeling exercise would have been a huge uncertainty and not added to knowledge as we wanted. So, we moved on. And this is the story of how we moved on. First of all, the carbon... I think we can trim this a bit like this. Yes, we can. Um, sorry, this, I loaded PowerPoint 10, 2010, 
over the weekend. I've never presented in it before, so it's going to be fun. Um, this is the next one I'll put up. You'll see energy going out for given wavelengths of infrared radiation for planets of different temperature. Our base temperature would be about 255 degrees. The greenhouse effect puts us up to about 273. I think that's about right. Here. This is degrees Kelvin, um, as an average. About 14, 13, 15 ish degrees. That's I'm being very general. The greenhouse gases take out particular wavelengths of the infrared. Carbon dioxide here, water vapor there, ozone there, a bit more from water vapor there. And as we increase the concentration, so we drive down the amount of energy coming up through that wavelength. Problem. May I just so check the smooth curves in the background? Those are black body radiation with, with no greenhouse effects. What we find is that as this goes down, so we saturate, come to the limits of the amount of energy in that wave band. All right? So the more the concentration goes up, the less effective it is as a greenhouse gas. And it has a graph a little bit like this one. In other words, if we look at a concentration of 140 to 80, 560 to 1120, the effectiveness of the greenhouse uh, gas moves from 4 watts for a doubling, 4 watts for another doubling, 4 watts for another doubling, about 1.2 degrees for each doubling. Whereas if it was linear, we'd go up 4, 8, 16, 32. Got me? So it's what we call a log form. And the beauty of this is if you scrunch that graph down, you can present it in a way that it looks like a straight line and it hides the curve on the uh, I think we can jump about 10 here. This is good. Yep, here we go. We scrunch that down. So this is the same data on what we call a semi log scale. And I'm beginning to look at sensitivity as well. So the black line there is the effect of carbon dioxide doubling from 140 to 280, just before the Industrial Revolution, to 560, which we're not at yet. We're about 390 about here. There's the 440 parts for million which they think is going to be safe, but it isn't. Um, now, what do the feedback loops do? First guess, right, first estimate, 1979, Julian and Charlie, Char, Char -ni, not Char -ni, um, came up with an answer of about three degrees for a doubling of CO2. In other words, it amplified it by about two and a half times. Included some water vapor feedbacks, some cloud feedbacks, some surface ice feedbacks, and reflectivity. None of the carbon cycle feedbacks, the vegetation cycles in a couple of Earth systems. And some of the slow feedbacks not included as well. Now, it's interesting that our ensemble of computer models today actually have a, a distribution around a mean, if you like, better than a mean, of just about that figure. Because the IPCC does tend not to, to weight the more competent models, even in um, the outputs that are used for decision making. So, one of the best models that so far is putting in the, the carbon cycle is from Hadley, our own weather centre here in the UK. And the next one, if I can get this one up in time, there's one like this, here we go. Um, Hadley. Includes some carbon cycle feedbacks, and they estimate roughly a four and a half degrees at doubling CO2 when it comes to an Amplification about three and three quarters. Is this powerful? What time scale are you running? This yes, uh, not at all. This is a concentration, not a time scale. But how long are you running that concentration to get that temperature? And not. It's a doubling at equilibrium. Oh, so right. I'm take so it's only at equilibrium. Yeah. Now, Jim Hansen recognizes that they don't include some of the long and slow feedbacks, like ice sheet melt and reflectivity from that. And he and his colleagues came up with an improvement again in the modeling. Do you remember when point is going to work? This is the one. Here's the Hansen model as well. 
about six degrees reduction with amplification of five. Now, what's very interesting about this is that the more we include, the better our models become, the higher the sensitivity goes. But there is some understanding that there is uh, an Earth system sensitivity towards which these models are, if you like, approaching. And that's the question we ask next. Can we find an answer to the question, by how much does the Earth system, including all known and unknown feedbacks, amplify what we do? The answer is, well, yes, we can. And I've got a lovely story where I'm going to take one of my precious minutes. I'm getting scowled at by everyone over here. Who dare? Don't waste your time. Here it is. It's called my climate cheetah. Um, World Zoological Society fellows met to say, how fast can the cheetah run? And they've got lots of computer models, so they divide their cheetah up into its liver functions, its heart functions, its lung functions, its twitches, its bum muscles, its so uh, wind resistance and a wind tunnel and so on. They've got every specialist working on their bit of the cheetah. And then they had integrative modeling capacity, put it all together in a system, and they came up with, we think, a cheetah could run at 28 and a half miles an hour. Give or take, plus or minus. And that meeting was attended by one of the game reserve wardens from South Africa. And he said, well, in South Africa, we could follow a cheetah in our jeep. We've got a um, monometer on it. Speed on. What Speed on. That would be a good thing to have as well as a man. She's very good. Um, so we went back this, well, we don't think these experimental methods are very reliable, really, but. So anyway, we went back and started to try and chase this cheetah. And it was a great You can't do that in a cheetah. So he said, I've got a friend in Pretoria who's in the police, and he uses one of those handheld radar guns on the traffic. So we went back to Pretoria, borrowed the radar gun, came back, and followed the cheetah. And he came back with a top speed of 71 and a half miles an hour. So he went back to the next meeting with great fellows of the Zoological Society and said, we put a, um, a, speed, a, a radar tracker on the thing and it comes back at 71 and a half miles an hour. That's two and a half times the outcome from our ensemble of computer models. And I think that shows up how much we should mistrust this kind of empirical data. We will prefer that you didn't come back to the meeting next year. Which take. Um, can we find a way of finding out how fast the cheetah goes? Yes, we can. First, we know that at the bottom of the ice age, um, on point with this thing, bottom of the ice age, we have a concentration of 180 parts per minute and a temperature about 5 degrees below the pre industrial. So that's a fixed point. Give or take little bits of temperature. This is a fixed point by definition. It has to go through there. So I've got the pre-industrial fixed point. I assume it's going to get through about an eighth of this rock and roll. Here's the pre-industrial fixed point. Um, so we can draw a straight line, because this is a, a straight line semi-log function. And we have 7.8, which is about two and a half times the sensitivity that comes out of our computer models. <coughs> Can we validate it? Yes, we can. And I use the work of Ferdinand Engelbein, regression analysis on the ice cores. And that puts in his point, which also came on the red line. And then the work of Mark Pagani, who's been working on the uh, ocean sediment cores and for the last 70 million years. And his sensitivity came out pretty well on the line as well. And then we did a mathematical cross-check because for every degree rise in temperature, so like the budget of the planet's radiation goes down by three and a third watts per square meter because we radiate that much energy back into space. So we know the feedbacks are taken up this amount. So between five for five degrees, five times three point three gives me a total budget of 16 and a half watts per square meter. We know that the contribution of the carbon dioxide is 2.5 watts, so we know the feedback system provided about 14. 
If you divide the overall by the contribution of the CO2, that's what we mean by amplification factor, we get an amplification factor of about 6.49, which is pretty close to 6.5. And if you multiply that by 1.2, which is how you get to sensitivity, we get a sensitivity of 7.79, which is pretty close to 7.8. I'm within two minutes of my term terminus. Now then. Okay, you need me to come back up and forth. That's because I'm trying to raise and think ahead and I can't do all at once. What we say is this. We have now a clear, well-defined, low uncertainty figure for whole Earth system sensitivity, which is running two and a half times that, currently being used in our global negotiations that come from computer models. I'm working now with the director of the World Wide Research Program in Geneva, to get that out and published and into the submitted documentation before the end of July. And that is only the beginning, because I could put in an extra 30 seconds. There is a relationship between feedback factor and amplification, which has a curve that comes up like this for you. Yes, like that. So that the higher the feedback factor, the more unstable the system becomes. And when we're working with feedback factors that are down around two and a half to three from our models, there's very little change in equilibrium temperature with our better understanding of feedback. In the Earth's system sensitivity, we are way up that curve and small changes in feedback create big changes in outputs. And all the work that is done on this modeling is based on slow, close to equilibrium change, and we ain't there. We're going 300 times faster or thereabouts than anything in the Paleo record. That pushes us away from equilibrium into fast change. And under those conditions, we start activating other feedbacks that increase this more and threaten to push it beyond that tipping point into a runaway situation. Now, that will all be in the paper. If you want the paper as it's currently drafted, give me an email, an email address, and I'll send it to you as it is now. That's Thank a summary. You. All right. Two hours. <laughs> 18 minutes. I think you've done that quite well. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. This uh, encompasses the time the next session will be starting. Surely it will take two short questions, and then I think we'll need to move, and I also need to go. So, one there, and then one in front. Oh, actually, you wait. You're right. You did put your hand up earlier on. I'm sorry. I'm going to go with him. Any comment on the reference to the stabilizing feedback in the Cretaceous geological geological period, which is the desertification? I don't really believe that that geological period was still six to eight degrees warmer. Because the obvious point is that a lot of uh, territory of the land. Uh, which is now under human habitation and cultivation, it consists of deserts. I have seen the top of the rainforest and underlay the growing in Suriname. Can you please ask the question? part of it is uh, underlay by pure white quartz sand, but it just doesn't leave those 6 to 8 degrees. Something else will happen before that time. I think there are two issues embedded in that. I'll try and tease them up a lot. One, Sensitivity may change over time with different functions on the Earth's surface, like human habitation and so forth. Yes, but what we have here is a function with very small change in the gradient between the bottom of the ice ages through the ice ages and in the descent from 1,000 parts per million from the Eocene down to the start of the ice age around sort of 300 parts per million. We expected that sensitivity to be less because it isn't subject to the ice feedbacks. But it seems to be the same right through. So we're going to get little, little variations, but the main gradient stays constant throughout. And the second part, um, I've forgotten completely. Come back. I just don't believe that we will get that far along the curve. Oh, I don't say. Just a minute. Human civilization. I'm picture of it. When it was 1,000 parts per million, the temperature was about 15 degrees above what it is now. Uh, the set of promises made under the Copenhagen Accord of Cancun and Durban push us up towards 900 to 1,000 parts per million in the scenario we can't get it. So we don't want to activate that kind of trajectory. We need to get, act much faster. There is no project. 
I'm sorry. That's right. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Very late question. question. Where are where are we now? Where are we now? Yeah. We are now at 392 parts per million. No, no but I mean in terms of the, the situation in the world, like how, whether we're probably or we've already done too much to be triggering. Do you mean are we past the tipping point or before one? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Where, where's your sort of intuitive sense of? The current global equilibrium. I don't have an intuitive sense, I have a well calculated sense. <laughs> Without putting the other stuff up, I don't think I can answer that. Can we, if there's two or three people who want to have a look at that, I'll do it in the hall out somewhere else. That's fine. Yeah, have to take a look at that. We are going to be above the red line by how much more I don't know. And that means we're in the boundary between reaching a high equilibrium and moving into a sort of amplifying situation. And I can't tell which. The methane group will be addressing one of the key factors that pushes us across that boundary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next session. Session.